from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for March 10th, 2023. Your Milwaukee Bucks are on the West Coast this week with Golden State, Sacramento, and Phoenix. Speaking of Phoenix, the Brewers spring training games continue in Arizona with the home opener just 23 days away. The St. Patrick's Day Parade is Saturday in downtown Milwaukee, and it's National Ranch Dressing Day. I added that just because I thought you'd like to know. <laughs> Let's start with some good advice from the National Park Service. When hiking and you encounter a bear on the trail, never push down a slower hiker. Remember, you don't need to be faster than the bear. You just need to be faster than your hiking buddies. Okay, let's go to Florida, where some invasive species is causing some major concerns. The brown basilisk, commonly known as the Jesus Christ lizard, has come to Florida. It got its name from its ability to run on water, and not because that's the first thing you say when you see one. <laughs> China has placed the ban on female fashion models wearing lingerie, and as a show of support for the women, male models are strutting their stuff on runways and lingerie. I'll never look at a Victoria's Secret catalog the same way again. Also from China, a Chinese man models his own line of high heels. He's making nearly $900,000 a month. Drag shows in China must be huge. In California, a cat is being credited with helping raise the alarm about a man who had fallen down a waterfall. What, did Lassie have the day off? <laughs> and finally, everybody, keep your shirts on. Last week we learned about diet marijuana. Well, this week we're learning about a topless marijuana shop in Watley, Massachusetts. The employees are called bud tenders, but will be topless and work drive through, will work the drive through window. That sounds better than a Happy Meal. <laughs> On the podcast today we have Adam Bailey, Tom Pappenfuss, Noel, Joel Driesing, and wrapping up the week, here's Kyle Tedding. Well, thanks, Max, for uh, maybe more light start to the week. Uh, the week's news, but unfortunately a down week overall for the markets. The Nasdaq down 4.7%, closing at 11.139. The S&P down 4.5%, closing at 38.62. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average down 4.4%, losing 345 points on Friday to close at 31.910. For the year, the Dow now negative, down 3.3%, including dividends. The S&P Still a positive number, up nine tenths of a percent, including those dividends. And the Nasdaq, a pretty stellar six point six percent still through the first couple of months of the year. You know, Adam, maybe the place to start is with Jay Powell's comments on Tuesday. Um, not completely unexpected, given the economic data that's been out there. Not completely unexpected, given that you know inflation continues to be uh, a bit stickier than what I think we had hoped. Uh, And yet the markets this week seem quite disappointed uh, that the Fed may have to go a little farther, a little faster than what we'd otherwise been talking about. Yeah. And one of the the phrases that it reminds me of this week is don't fight the Fed. And I think the market has forgotten that, Um, maybe remembered it this week. Uh, But you look at some of his comments and it was basically kind of more the same. You know, our job is not done here. Uh, We're going to see this through and we're still going to adhere to a game plan of trying to cool an overheating economy and, uh, you know, bring inflation kind of back in line. And uh, the market had to just re-digest that this week. And, um, you know, it's not something that really is new news because we've been talking about this. They have been foretelling it and and they have been very good with their communication to the market. But for whatever reason, the market just got ahead of itself and said, okay, you know, maybe they won't have to raise as much or maybe inflation isn't as sticky as we thought. And we get some good job numbers out this this week. And you know, it just goes to show you there's still a fair amount of economic strength and momentum out there just reminding us that, okay, the Federal Reserve is going to have to raise rates and maybe keep them higher. Um, just to, what we got to remember. Adam, I'm always amazed reading the, the articles that come out when things like this happen with when Chairman Powell, you know, addresses people or gives a news conference. And it's all like, well, he clarified that the Fed doesn't have a set plan, that they're going to watch things and address it accordingly. And like you say, I mean, that's all they've been saying all along. So it's not really a surprise. 
You know, Tom, I think part of the, the conversation here revolves around the direction that interest rates are headed. Certainly, you know, you look at shorter term bonds this week, they took a pretty big jump. Tuesday, Wednesday, on the, the news from the Fed. And yet, as we look at longer-term interest rates, the move this week, in particular on the 10-year, down from 3.96% at the end of the week last week to 3.7% this week, I don't think the market has really shifted long-term expectations all that much. Um, and so, if anything, kind of this divergence between near-term expectations and what we see longer-term is is more the problem now. Yeah, I think... You know, it, it's you know what I was going to kind of piggyback on with. There's a lot of confusion, I think, in the markets. What's what we're seeing right now is you know with equities, we're seeing a lot of the the risk on type of assets still continue to do well, showing better performance year to date. Um, although you know that would kind of signal that we're not worried about a recession. Uh, you know, I guess from a, an equity standpoint. Um, but all the while, you know, we have Federal Powell coming out and telling us that. You know, rates are going to go higher and we're going to keep fighting this. And so it, it's just I think it's really interesting. It's really difficult time for for investors to kind of grasp a hold of what who's right. You know, what's happening? What's the market? What are equities telling us? What are bonds telling us? Um, you know, and, and, you know, we're seeing one of the biggest inverted, you know, yield curve inversions here uh, since I think 1981 was the last time I saw it with, with uh, the, the marginal difference between the maybe the two tens or even going, a, you know, a different short versus long. Um, and so usually, typically, you start to see that being a signal of a, an oncoming recession at some point. But market's kind of saying, I don't know. <laughs> you know. It's an interesting topic you bring up, you know, short-term rates versus long-term rates. What is the bond market trying to tell us and as it relates to inflation? And I think it's telling us that you know, in, inflation, it's, it, it's a bit like wet paint. I mean, the longer it hangs around, the stickier it gets. And it's starting to get sticky, but it's not going to stick around forever. And you take a look at the yield on like the, the one-year or two-year treasuries where it's you, you get something in the 5-ish percent range. But then you start looking out 10 years or 30 years, and we got the 10-year bond finished the week at 3.7. So it kind of shows you that inflation might be an issue here in the near term, but the bond market is saying it might not stick around forever. Well, and I think it's important to understand that the Federal Reserve controls those short-term rates, and the market controls the rest. And so if we're talking about long-term expectations, if we're talking about what the market thinks, the 10-year number is probably a better number to look at. You know, I think as we, we talk about some of the other issues that are out there this week, you know, the, the big headline this morning, Friday morning, was the potential collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. And then, of course, shortly thereafter, there's a headline that, oh, by the way, they're in receivership now. The FDIC has taken over. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank. I already, uh, within the span of a few hours, had a few client questions on it, uh, and I'm sure that there'll be more. I think a strong reminder, first and foremost, that if you're investing in an asset that has a very focused customer base, a very focused uh, line of business, which Silicon, Silicon Valley Bank very clearly did, you're, you're investing in a very particular risk. And so for the bank itself to have the number of customers involved in kind of the technology field, in particular high net worth investors, where a lot of their financial liquidity might have been tied up in private equity or the stock of their individual company, when they need money, either to put back into their business or for other purposes, they're going to go to the bank to get it. And if that bank also was taking a lot of risk with the investments, the assets that they chose to back those deposits, you've, you've got a, a risk on your hand that maybe isn't well understood. And so, you know, Adam, I think as we look at kind of <clears throat> the first meaningful bank default in a while, maybe fair to say that this one's going to look a little different than the rest of the financial markets. Yeah. And I also think we need to like define uh, Silicon Valley Bank is, um, I, I guess, sizable in their own right, but they are not a big bank. Uh, let's be clear, you know, big, big banks um, have to undergo like stress tests every single year. They have capital requirements that they must adhere to. And uh, Silicon Valley Bank is not nearly big enough to, to qualify for one of those critical institutions. Um, and it, it just goes to show you how they collapsed at warp speed this week. Um, you know, having a bank that uh, has perhaps poor capital requirements and then a, a hyper-focused clientele of just, uh, you know, lending to um, technology businesses, that can turn quickly on you. 
Um, the FDIC has already taken it over and just uh, going to make depositors whole as best they can within their requirements. Um, so it's good to see the government act quickly on something along those lines. Well, and I think important to point out that while it's been a while since we've seen a bank failure, certainly this is one of the bigger banks, historically the second largest, although your points are, va- are quite valid. I want to be clear that it's not all that uncommon to see this kind of thing. Yeah, you're right. And you look back in the last 20 years, we've had 20 banks, give or take, that have um, had this happen to them. So on average, we get one every single year. And okay, fine, this is this might be it for the year. But the, you're right. This is a more normal occurrence than you would think. And more importantly, the FDIC has a pretty good process in place to take ownership of these banks. I recall... Uh, going back just a few years now, but in my own hometown, there was a local community bank that was taken over by the FDIC. That transition happened quite expeditiously. The process for uh, clients of that bank under that 250000 FDIC limit doesn't change all that much. And so, you know, yeah, there might be some headaches for those individuals in a bank like SVB where there were some larger deposit balances. Uh, but Let's be clear that the FDIC has served a very important purpose here, that the the banking oversight is functioning the way it's supposed to, to ensure liquidity, especially for smaller clients of the bank. Um, You know, they get that priority treatment. uh, And so I'm, I'm always a little nervous about what this means for maybe the banking community at large. I don't want to overemphasize the importance that this one issue, and, and maybe there's one or two more out there with some of the cryptocurrency banks that are having some trouble right now as well, but I don't want to overemphasize the importance of this one bank failure other than to stress that it appears that in this case, the process is working the way it's supposed to work. The FDIC has made clear that checks written against that bank are going to be cashed just like they always had, and that by Monday, the bank that's essentially taking over for SVB is going to be up and running and customers will be able to go in and ask those questions they need to ask. And so, um, yeah, it's a a scary thing, especially because the financial crisis is on everyone's mind when we're talking about the banking system, systemic risks of the banking system. This one's different. um, And I know there's a risk in saying that. And it doesn't mean that we aren't going to have some other failures, that there aren't some other concerns out there. But at least this particular bank failed for a very different reason. And Kyle, remember that the FDIC was set up after the Great after the Great Depression, um, and and it's actually set up. I mean, to protect depositors, but also to protect banking, because it you know the government steps in and makes sure makes sure that depositors are okay, and the banking system is better off because people have more confidence in the banking system. Yeah, I think this, you know, particularly this will touch a nerve, right? Based on 2008, everyone's a little bit more concerned about it. You know, I guess I'm the optimist and looking at the silver lining is that, well, because of how narrow and how specific these this particular bank's activities were, it can kind of be a good litmus test for, okay, everyone check your balance sheets, re-look at everything and kind of reevaluate that landscape in its entirety. So, you know, that one can kind of be you know, that, that, that stress test to kind of force everyone else to kind of relook at everything and make sure nobody else has some outside risks that we might be exposed to. You know, speaking of that, the, the Federal Reserve every year kind of completes their stress test for the largest 33 critical banks. Uh, for what it's worth, the last time they did that last year, 33 out of 33 passed their stress test. And those tests aren't easy either. I mean, they're looking at things pretty critically to make sure that, you know, Tom, as you say, the, the issues we've had in the past aren't aren't the issues we're dealing with in the future. And so and I think those are all very valid points. I think there's going to be plenty that's written about even between the time this gets recorded and the time this gets listened to. Uh, but understand that, you know, at least for now, uh, I, I'm pretty pretty confident that this issue looks very different than some of the issues we've dealt with in the past. You know, Joel, the the big news this week beyond the Fed seems to be some of the employment data um, it seemed early Friday like maybe the, the, the numbers were good news and then all of a sudden they were bad news again. And I think really what it's telling us is that the message continues to be mixed. Yeah, that's right, Kyle. And, and it's interesting to, to read through all of that because there are a lot of people who, you know, I, I, I think, um, as you were pointing out before, try to parse the, the details to, to try to 
figure out what's going on in the short term. And, and these month-to-month reports where a lot of the numbers can change by revision um, aren't necessarily good signs of what's going on right now. But if you look at the last three or the last six, or if you look at the longer trends, it's a little more telling in far, as far as telling you what the directions are. But yeah, it's, you know, and, and you, if you think of the Fed as, um, you know, that bad news for the economy is good news for what the Fed is trying to do, right? Because it's trying to slow down the economy to keep inflation in check. So this was, yeah, it was mixed news. It was, you know, we, um, the employers added 311,000 jobs in February, which was more than expected. And it's a very healthy pace, but it's also um, slower than it's been. It's, you know, slower than the three-month, six-month, 12-month average, um, slower than it was the, the, the month before that but it's still very healthy. Um, the unemployment rate went up uh, to 3.6%. It was at 3.4% before that, which was tied for the lowest since 1969. So it's telling us that the, the job market is still very robust, but maybe it's slowing down a little bit. And that 3.6%, you know, the, the rate went up actually because there were more people who were um, losing their jobs or finishing up temporary work. It wasn't that um, sometimes we see the inflation, the uh, unemployment rate go up because new people are coming off the sidelines and, and applying for jobs. And that wasn't the case this time. It was more people losing their jobs and um, you know finishing assignments. And then you know I was looking at some of the other details of it, and um, the the report showed that uh, temporary help hiring is is still going up. It's been up four out of the last six months, and that's usually a harbinger for a healthy labor market. So at the same time, we're seeing these signs that things are slowing down. We're also seeing at least that sign that maybe things aren't slowing down that much. Um, Also, the labor force participation rate, um, which is something that we look at to see, uh, you know, of the people who are able to work um, and of a certain age, you know, how many are, are engaged in either working or, or looking for work. And that's at the highest point that it's been since March of 2020. But again, it's very reduced from, you know, it, it's like 23% now. Um, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It's 62.5% in February. Um, and that's the highest that it's been since, uh, s- since March of 2020. But it's down from you know, 63%. Uh, just before the pandemic, and 66% um, just before the Great Recession. And I think, you know, a lot of the the employment data comes down to how do the consumers feel about what's going on. If the consumers aren't working, if the consumers can't find a job, um, they, they're not going to be spending money, either because they can't or because they're not sure next month if they're going to be able to. Um, the other thing that, you know, I think is worth pointing out, we got some news on revolving debt this week. Um, which is just another indicator, I think, of how the consumer's feeling and how the consumer's doing. Right, yeah. So credit card use, according to some Fed numbers, um, it's it's up to one, $1.2 trillion in, in the month of January, um, and that's 10% above where it was before the pandemic. Um, and it's much higher than, it's, it's much higher than that, of course, um, th- than it was at, at the, the trough, um, you know, right after the pandemic. But um, so so that's pretty high, and and sometimes that's a measure of the confidence of consumers because they they feel that they can pay their credit card bills, so they're going to keep spending. But it can also be a sign that they're running out of other money to spend. And we're looking at uh, savings numbers. We look at the, the Fed has some numbers on um, how much people are saving, and that is down. I mean, it's 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 uh, one sixth of what it was. Um, you know, b- back before the pandemic. So it's, um, that's getting lower. And, and um, you know, of course, it went up really high to record levels when we got the stimulus money and people have been spending through that. And now, who knows? I mean, maybe, maybe we've reached a point where people are spending the money they had and they're just using credit cards. So it's not much of a sign of confidence as it is of, of desperation. You know, just to take a step back for a moment, the reason why we spend so much time focusing on the consumer uh, is because the consumer drives the economy. It drives 70% of our economy. And if we are going to go into a recession, it's going to be because the consumer would collapse. And at the moment, you take a look at consumer health, 
household debt service ratio, okay, fine, it's up a little bit, but it's still historically quite low. Uh, assets to, to total liabilities, still pretty good. We've spent down half of $2 trillion excess savings that we had from the pandemic. You got about $1 trillion left, give or take. And you have a, a rising wages and a solid job market. So it, it would make sense that people put stuff on credit cards thinking you can pay it back. And you start to look at all of the various aspects of consumer lives, and consumers are still in the driver's seat of this economy. And it's why we can't look at any of these data points in isolation. It's why you've got to say, all right, consumers are spending more on credit cards, but here's a few reasons why. Or the wage uh, that we're having to pay workers is up a little bit, but here's why that may not be as big of an issue. They're more productive or uh, there's more job openings, and so we have to pay them more. And so I think none of this is in a vacuum. And of course, when you look at What's going to lead to that recession? Yeah, we can talk about the correlation between an inverted yield curve. We did. We talked about how the 10-year Treasury paints a very different picture than what shorter-term bonds are painting. Remember that that's not the cause of a recession. It's correlated with recession. It's something that we tend to see leading in. Um, But it isn't the thing that causes it. What causes it, Adam, as you, you rightfully point out, is consumers. Consumers unwilling or unable to spend. Um, And at least for now, that's not the problem. And so, um, you know, as we look at, well, the prospects of slowing economic growth, I think that's likely. The real question is how much we slow, how significant, and for how long. Um, And at least for now, um, mixed economic data, while it's a, a bad thing for this week, it's a sign that the economy continues to muddle along. So I'll take it. Thank you all for listening to the program. We enjoyed doing it for you. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com.